a new model of team performance, optimizing team brain power for maximum results. Hosted today by HRDQU and presented by Kevin Sensenig. Today's webinar will last about an hour. Now, before we begin, note that you can submit any questions that you have using the chat window. Now, that's usually located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And we'll then either answer those questions right as they come in. Uh, we'll do them live. We, we should have time here with Kevin to uh, answer some live questions at the end of the presentation. And then we'll also follow up by email as well. My name is Sarah Montgomery, and I will moderate today's webinar. I am in business development for HRDQ, a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. This past July, we had the pleasure of presenting a webinar called Leadership Agility. Maybe some of you were on it. And that was with Ann Herman. Today, we are pleased to host yet another webinar with Herman International. Please welcome Kevin Sensenig. He has more than 20 years of experience in management, leadership, and training for major corporations, such as Dale Carnegie. He is a registered organization development professional and a member of several training and development communities, including ODI, ATD, and SHRM. Kevin co-edited the source book for self-directed learning, and he has written for well-known publications such as T&D Magazine, Training Magazine, and Talent Management Magazine. Welcome, Kevin, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Sarah, and, and welcome to everyone that joined us today. Uh, it's certainly an honor to be with you today and to talk about this idea of optimizing team brain power to maximize, uh, maximize results. You know, it's an honor for me to be with you because I believe developing and leading and empowering teams is an opportunity to have great impact in an organization. And as a leader, what could be better than that? I don't know about you, but I do find myself involved in a whole variety of teams. Some of those are formal teams, some of those are informal groups, some of those are ad hoc groups of individuals that come together for a, a short period of time. Uh, some of those are cross-functional teams, some are cross-cultural teams, some are cross-departmental teams. But in a given day, I find myself interacting with other individuals in a teaming or team or group environment. And that seems to be pretty common because there's a recent study done by CEB and they found that Three quarters of employees say they have seen an increase in the amount of work they do in a collaborative or team environment over the last several years. So we do see this increase in teaming taking place in many organizations. Half of those employees said that they find they're finding an increase in the number of stakeholders they need to have involved in making decisions to get things done in their organization. So we see an increase in teaming and an increase in interaction around decision making. So I think that's a common commonality we're seeing across many organizations. In that same study, they found that two-thirds of the employees said that more of their coworkers are now working in geographically dispersed locations in that team environment. So I think we're also sensing that increase in, in virtual teaming. At the same time, Phoenix University did a study, and they found 84% of workers said that they find it difficult to work in teams. So while we see this increase in teaming, this increase in team-based decision-making, this increase in virtual and cross-cultural teams, we also are sensing that there's probably some challenges that many organizations face and many employees face working in organizations from that teaming perspective. So I'd like to start out with a little input from you around your experience in working in teams. And I'm going to ask Sarah to jump back in and help us with a poll to look through how many teams you find yourself working on at any given point in time. We have so if you would just, mm -hmm. yep. and you just want to choose one of those radio buttons there, A, B, C, or D, and we'll take a minute here for everyone to get a chance to vote in. We've got good participation today. Good. And as you're finishing that up, it's a pretty quick response. If you could also maybe in your uh, in your chat window just. Just text in a quick comment about your experience with the dy dynamics of those teams. Do you find teams in your organization have outstanding dynamics? They work well together. Things really get done. You just put outstanding there. Uh, you say it's poor. You wish it would be better. Put poor in there or varied. Some are good. Some are different. Uh, it would kind of be uh, good to get a sense of 
kind of what's your experience with the dynamic of teams in your organization as well. Okay, and it looks like we have pretty much everyone has weighed in, so I'm going to go ahead and share the results there. Excellent. So, uh, you know, many people are saying well over two teams, right? A few people say I'm on one team, and that's where I really focus, but most people are in that four and five or five or more teams, which is, again, very consistent what we find in, in the research that's out there. Interesting is I'm looking at some of the responses in the, in the chat area. Uh, you know, it's, it, it is varied. People say some teams do pretty well, some teams don't do so well. So uh, I think that goes back to what we're finding in the research and what we see in organizations uh, pretty much globally, that uh, more and more are working in a variety of team environments, and there's some opportunities to make that experience a little bit better. In fact, we may find ourselves a little bit like this. Even in small organizations, we tend to find ourselves functioning in a much broader array of activities and roles and responsibilities within, within those teams. So let's see in the day to look at what are some of the uh, elements of successful teams. How do we then begin to identify and use some tools to help our teams be more successful? And then talk a little bit about how we can apply some of those tools to really bring out the best of our overall team dynamic. To start that, we probably need to start a little bit with what is a team. Uh, and I think we all have different perspectives on teams. Uh, many of us definitely think about early in our life, if he's you know, playing on a sports team of some type, uh, we can probably relate to you know, sports teams we may watch today or be familiar with in our community. But that kind of just kind of moved itself into the, the professional ranks as well. We kind of identify this idea of teaming in, in, a, in a professional setting. And when you look up the definition of a team, it talks about a group of people with complementary skill sets who come together to work interdependently, they share authority, responsibility, they share a sense of accountability to an outcome, and many of those great terms. And that all sounds very exciting. You know, when I read the definition of a team, I think that's exactly where I want to function and play and work. Uh, but again, as we're finding from people we talk to in organizations and the research around teams is that that doesn't always tend to play itself out. Unfortunately, it doesn't follow that wonderful definition of a team and lead to that perfect sense of direction and commonality and outcome. Unfortunately, many of us find ourselves in that poor environment where we're kind of all in the same boat, but there's a differing view depending on where we're sitting in that boat, right? And so sometimes we like to be on that higher side, out of that water, saying, you know what, Are you guys bail out down there, we're going to stay up here nice and dry. And that might feel really good for us, but it's probably not doing the best to drive the ultimate team environment that that we need to be driving as we go forward. So let's think about what really does make a successful or a great team. Uh, many of us, again, can probably re relate this very clearly to, to sporting events. And, and the picture of this is the 1986 New York Mets team uh, who came together and, and no one expected really great things out of them, but they, they achieved well beyond what was expected of them. And the reason I mention that team and bring them up when we talk about what is a great team or what makes a great team is that this happens to be a team that comes up a lot in the literature around teaming. So when you read about teams in a professional environment, many times they talk about 1986 Mets and what they were able to do. The interesting thing is, is that depending on the author, they tend to identify a whole host of different ideas and concepts and attributes and characteristics that they believe made that team great. As a team leader, that can be very difficult to figure out what's the kernel of truth in there, what's the piece I can take and replicate. And so you end up reading all these wonderful things about teams that succeed and say, how do I actually do that? On the other side, we can also read about teams that were not so successful. For, for anyone that followed the, uh, the World Cup this past summer, you know, much was written about the Brazilian team. It started out extremely well the first few, few weeks of the, of the World Cup experience and then uh, really got decimated the last several games. And there's a lot written about why they did not succeed as a team and why they didn't, uh, why they didn't have that success towards the end of their World Cup run. And again, it was all these different perspectives and ideas. And it, when you read all of that, it's interesting. You take something away, you say, oh, I've got to do this or avoid doing something else. But it's difficult to figure out how I actually bring that over and make that part of my team experience. As I said, there's a lot written about teams, and it can be a little bit confusing. Is it A or is it B that I should be implementing? Should I have that sense of common vision, or do I work on group process? Do I think about having lots of contact with people, or do I need to, to really look at uh, you know, having common goals among the team. Any of those things in and of themselves are very valuable and helpful. The challenge is how do you distill that down and figure out how we move it forward to help the team to truly be successful? And I don't really think it's something magical. I don't think team success starts out magically. It might end up there. But I would really suggest it starts with a clear commitment that we want to have a great team. 
And so if we have that clear commitment to having a great team, we're willing to do the things it takes to have that team in place and to function well with that team, then we have to think about what are some of those key components for team success. What are things that we can identify, things that we can replicate, things that we can do consistently with our team to assure that we're ultimately achieving that success. So we want to look in today's webinar at these four key components of successful teams. How do we bring that diversity of thinking to the table? How do we begin to bring out the best of each person's thinking preferences and understand where they're coming from, where I fit with them, and how together we can find the best answer, the best result, the best interaction? How do we begin to build team agility, where now you have that sense of being able to help the team adapt to one another, adapt to the environment in which they function? And I would suggest most times teams start out with a very clear direction of where they want to go, but very quickly that environment changes. Something outside of the organization changes with a customer or with the, with the industry base. Something changes internally with team members or team leaders or culturally. And that begins to have an impact on the team. So that we help teams be successful in adapting to those types of changes as they go forward. Third, how do we make sure we have a sense of confidence and engagement among the team members so that they have the confidence to step forward with ideas, to share their, their direction, and at times to, to really uh, engage in some strong, robust dialogue that's going to take to move the team forward. And then lastly, how do we build that sense of focus so that we make sure we are, are truly achieving that desired outcome? Well, it starts with that sense of diversity. And it's not just so much about making sure we have the traditional characteristics of diversity represented in the team. That's certainly valuable. It brings perspective. and helps us to really function better as an organization. But we really want to function or think about when we think about this idea of diversity in a team environment is really driving that sense of thinking diversity, or being diverse by design, as we call it. And trying to move away from just thinking in terms of behaviors and those natural characteristics of individuals and moving beyond that in the conversation to how do we get to really dealing with true issues, true problems, and true uh, decisions that need to be made and working through that at a very high level. And we find that working with organizations, it's best when we do that, when we do that consciously, when we think about who do we need in this environment, on this team, to truly bring that strength of thinking diversity. Not just who's closest to us, who happens to be sitting closest to the boss at the time, or who would we think politically should be on the team. Let's think about the real issue that exists and drive at building the team that's really going to be in the best position to, to resolve that. And from a Herman perspective, we actually believe in and, and, and teach a lot around this idea of the whole brain model, that all of us have that, that sense of ability to think in a variety of ways and to offer our ideas, our thoughts, and our input from a variety of perspectives that can truly help the organization overall be most successful. Some of you may be familiar with the whole brain model itself. And if not, you at least are familiar with this idea of a quadrant-based model that kind of says there are these interactions within individuals. Uh, and from a thinking perspective and a whole brain perspective, what we recognize is that there are a variety of preferences we have about how we utilize the strength of our brain. Some of us are much stronger in that blue quadrant area, which is much more the analytical type thinking, looking at the more logical and measurable and quantitative aspect of how things are decided, how problems are addressed, and, and how we interact with other people. Other of us, others of us may be stronger and have more preference in that green quadrant area, which is much more around that safekeeping self and being, having things organized and planned and sequential so that we make sure things happen consistently over time. So other individuals have a strength of preference in that red quadrant, which is much more around the interpersonal aspect of ourselves, being comfortable with the emotion and the interaction and the connectivity between individuals in our team environment. While so others have real strength in that yellow quadrant, being able to see that bigger vision, that bigger picture, being able to synthesize and bring together a variety of unique ideas to create something new and be more experimental and innovative in, in that type of thinking. Now, from our perspective, we're not suggesting that any one of these is better or worse than the other. Uh, we as individuals have access to all of these thinking preferences and all of these thinking concepts within, within the power of our brain. What we have to recognize is that we all do have some dominance. There are, there are aspects of what's shown on the screen that we naturally have preference to connect to. So some of us may be a little bit more on that left side of the model, and we're more comfortable with that very uh, analytical and safekeeping and plan type thinking. So we start in that process, and then later we come over and say, how does that play into the bigger picture? How does that begin to play out with our team members? Others of us are more strong and more preferred on the, preferred on the, on the right-hand side of the model. 
we're very comfortable with, how does this impact other people, and what's the bigger picture of this? And then we'll come later over to that left-hand side and look at how we prove out the ROI and how we lay out the steps in the process. Other of us are stronger at the top end of the model. We look at that logical and big picture view first, and then later we'll come down to how it impacts other people and how we begin to sequence and plan out the details of, of that program. Well, so others of us are stronger in that bottom quadrant, uh, bottom two quadrants, where we are very comfortable starting with the sequencing and the interpersonal interactivity and how that fits, and then later we'll come back and say, now, where does it take us going forward? So we're not suggesting any one of those concepts or ideas or approaches is better or worse than the other. We just want to recognize from being diverse by design that every individual brings some of that preference to the table. And so how do we begin to, to build our teams and bring out the best of our teams by understanding first what are people's natural preferences in their thinking approach? From that sense of the, of the thinking preference, then they can look at that idea of flexibility. All of us have that flexibility in our brain where we can say, yes, I'm strongest in that blue quadrant. That's my preferred area to start. But I'm very comfortable stretching over into that yellow quadrant or stretching over into the red quadrant when I need to. And so we have to understand that even though we have preferences in our brain and the dominance in our brain and how we think and how we approach things, we do have that flexibility to, to adapt and adjust. And being that many of us on the call are in the training and development field, we also recognize that we have the ability to build skill and competence in areas that we may not prefer to work in. So I may be very good in that interpersonal area, very comfortable working with other individuals, may not be as strong maybe in that blue quadrant of laying out the ROI and all the analytical planning and logical sequencing, but I can learn to do that over time. So again, it's not just a matter of you have a thinking preference and that's where you're stuck. We have the ability to be flexible and to stretch and adapt. The model helps us understand what are the different thinking preferences people bring to the table. If we're really going to begin to build a, a diverse team, people that can really think about our challenges and our approaches and our issues differently, we have to be able to appreciate and understand first our own thinking preference, and then secondly the thinking preference of other people. And with that in mind, then it allows us to begin to build teams that truly focus on thinking diversity. Uh, and at Caesars Entertainment, they, they use this very clearly. Uh, when they think about a team-based situation, they consider what's the scope and the time frame and the direction and the results that need to be achieved by the team. And based on those factors, then they begin to look at who do we want to bring onto the team to begin to solve that problem and solve a real business problem, not have to deal constantly with all of the interpersonal aspects before they can get to that next level. So when we think about focusing on diversity of thinking first, it's really understanding what do we want to accomplish and how do we bring the right thinking and the right preferences to bear so that we can design our team in a way that it can truly be successful. With that in mind, it also allows individuals to accept differences in others more effectively if they understand their preferences and other people's preferences. And obviously that allows them to, to build in that mutual acceptance of one another, mutual acceptance of ideas, move things forward because they appreciate the perspective people are bringing to the table from the beginning. And it's not a matter of, why would you say that? And why can't you be more like me? No matter if I know where I'm strong, I know where I prefer to work, I see where you're bringing in a different perspective, now I can see how those two ideas together can help us achieve a greater result. So the first key in really beginning to build the team in the right direction is having that sense of being diverse by design. Having that thinking diversity in place that allows us to bring out the best of all team members and truly begin to, to address the bigger picture of what needs to be done within the team. From that standpoint, then we can begin to move to that idea of thinking agility and being able to adapt more effectively to the issues and situations that may change in the team dynamic and team environment as we move forward. And so it's not enough just to say, well, we have a diverse team of thinkers together and we have a diverse group of people together. I'm sure they'll work it out. No, we have to encourage that team, support that team, and work with that team to demonstrate that adaptability, to begin to stretch across their thinking preference, to begin to stretch across one another and again, find ways of making one another even stronger. And a valuable tool in doing that is to have team members be thinking about where they fit into the team and how they can best contribute to the team. And you'll see this is laid out much like the whole brain thinking model itself, because we want to make sure we're considering the value of those various thinking preferences. And we call this a team preparation walk around, which is simply a way to help people think about four key aspects of how they can best contribute to the team and fit into that team dynamic uh, most effectively. Some individuals start right at that upper uh, left-hand corner with the blue area, and they say, I'm going to understand the goal and purpose of the team, then I'm going to do the green quadrant, look at the specific role I can play, 
move over and think about how I feel about that, and then I'll come to that yellow quadrant and figure out, you know, how does that play into the bigger picture of the organization or the team dynamic? Many of you probably looked at this and naturally gravitated to one of the areas. You might have said, well, I, I like to start with the big picture. Where is this team going to go? And how does it play into the bigger picture of the organization? And how do I feel about that? With that in mind, then I can think about the goal of the team and my specific role. So there's no one perfect way of following the model. It's simply a matter of making sure we're considering all the key elements of what it takes to be a successful team member and to truly be adaptable to where I need to be playing at a given point in time. So I may look at this and, and recognize that Boy, a lot of people are really clear on the role they want to play on the team. Maybe I need to come over and, and spend a little time in that red quadrant, make sure that fits for everyone. Everyone really does have a good place to play on the team. Or maybe I need to spend a little more time laying out that bigger picture for the team so that we're clear on where we need to go and it's not getting bogged down in all the details of the roles, but really helping us to move forward. So a tool like this helps individuals adapt themselves into the team, helps the team adapt to one another more effectively, and really sets up that sense of, of agility. Because when we understand that diversity of thinking, what our preferences are, what other people's preferences are, we understand a model like this is how does each member fit best into the team and contribute most effectively in the team, it allows you to move beyond the idea of trying to change other people and really begin to think about how do we adapt ourselves to addressing the issue at hand. Uh, and a client that we work with, Intercontinental Hotel Group, found that to be very valuable. Uh, they found when they were trying to drive projects forward, they had lots of employees with really good ideas, insights, and suggestions to get things done, but they couldn't always organize themselves in a way and follow through the detailed plans of that to accomplish those, those bigger goals and those bigger outcomes. And so they thought, well, we'll just add someone with some really strong green preference to the table. We'll bring someone who's really good at managing the project and managing all the details. And that didn't go so well at first because those individuals came in trying to drive this sense of we're going we're to tell you what to do and you go out and make it happen. And in the team environment, that doesn't always work so well. You need that sense of interplay and interconnectivity and adaptability to one another. So when they implemented the whole brand approach, they recognized that that allowed people to see where do I best fit on the team, how do I best contribute to the team, and how do I make sure my role is adding value to other members of the team. And so it allowed them to move away from feeling like they were just having some people do the leading and some people do the teaming, and really allowed them to focus on how do we as a team begin to move forward and accomplish things together rather than having the divisions within the team and, and negative interactions among team members, you can now do that in a more positive way because they have the diversity and the agility to adapt to one another. So once you have those two pieces in place, this sense of thinking diversity and that agility and ability to adapt to what's going on around you, that really sets the context for a successful team. It allows you to have the basis for how the team can function most effectively. And then you can really turn your attention to how do we now drive execution with the team? How do we move forward and actually get some key things done. And that means we have to do that third key element of success in a team, and that's truly engagement. How do we engage one another most effectively to get things done? When I think about teams, and, and the picture that's here kind of gives that in, image of a, of a machine, and I think there's some, some interconnectivity between the idea of a machine and, and a team, and that you know, a machine works best when there's that contact and friction. When things come together, and the parts of the machine really come together and begin to to, to hit one another and interact with one another, that's where you get the energy and the productivity from that friction and that interplay. The same thing happens in a team environment. Teams are most effective when they have that interplay and that dynamic sense of contact and connectivity. And of course, that does lead to friction. There are times that leads to positive friction where you, you, you know, two or three ideas come together and all of a sudden you have a, a great synergistic idea come out of that. Sometimes that goes through some really negative friction and people begin to kind of pull away from each other and it begins to slow down the the success of the team. And so I go back to the value of setting that context with the thinking diversity and the thinking agility that allows you to kind of oil that machine a little bit or oil that team a little bit so they can more effectively begin to work that friction, that energy, and that productivity to, to drive towards your ultimate outcome. But it is important that you recognize any time a team comes together, you're going to have that natural, uh, that natural energy that builds out of the friction and the content that takes place. Probably one of the the key areas that we need to pay attention to and focus on from a team dynamic of engagement is that sense of do our team members have the confidence to stand up and really point their position out with passion and desire and direction and recognize that sometimes will lead to some sense of conflict. And unfortunately, many teams we find fear that idea of conflict. They're afraid that, well, if I start to really uh, you know, have a differing opinion, I'm going to maybe alienate someone or offend them, and then they'll, they'll work against me rather than with me on the team environment. 
we find when you bring in that right sense of thinking diversity and thinking agility, now you can engage people in a way that they don't feel that hesitancy to share their ideas. They're more comfortable and confident to step up and say, here's my perspective on that. Here's the way I begin to see that issue. And we can appreciate and value one another in that process. Now, a couple of things to look for as you think about your teams is, and you try to understand where they're at with this idea of conflict would be, look at their team meetings. How do those team meetings function and flow? Do you have a situation where uh, team meetings kind of seem boring and flat? There's not a lot of real, robust dialogue. That might indicate people are afraid to step up and share a conflicting idea or conflict. Or maybe you sense your team leave the meeting and go for the meeting after the meeting, right? They get all get around the, the water cooler in their various corner of the office and begin to talk about what really should be happening with the team. Those are a couple of key indicators of the team leader that maybe we have some fear of conflict here and we don't have that positive energy coming out of that friction and that, that contact with the team. We have some negative productivity coming out of that team. And that may go back to, again, getting people that confidence to step up and begin to share their ideas uh, passionately and, and, and purposefully because it helps to move the team forward and really focus on that ultimate outcome. We find working with whole brain teams that when you have that understanding that, yeah, we are different and that's okay, then you can really move the team beyond any of that interpersonal uh, friction and really move to that friction around driving towards the, out, the ultimate outcome. And that's really what organizations want to see, that we have that diversity, agility, and engagement on the real issues, not just on the personal issues, so that we can begin to work together effectively to drive the ultimate result. So with that in mind, let's think about this idea of focus then. How do we get the team truly focused in the right direction? And I would suggest that it really comes down to a couple of keys, that we have a purpose of why that team is here. Why are individuals on the team, and why does that team exist? When we have that sense of purpose, people can now rally around that. And they can begin to build a commitment to one another on the team environment, but more importantly, commitment to that ultimate outcome and that ultimate purpose. And when that's in place, now you begin to have a team that's focused in the right direction, begin to work together to drive a better outcome. That opens itself up, or opens the team up more effectively to positive accountability. Accountability for contribution to the team, and accountability for results from the team. And again, when you have that purpose, commitment, and accountability, now you have the right type of focus to begin to drive a team forward. So again, let's get some input from you as a group and your thoughts around this idea of purpose. Um, in your opinion, what do you find is most important for team success? If you just select A, B, C, or D, and Sarah's going to open up the poll here in a moment, There we go. You should see that open now. Good. The votes are coming in pretty quickly here, so we'll keep it open for another few seconds, give everyone a chance to read through those five options. This is a little more thinking, a little more thinking than the previous one, a little quicker. So it is. <laughs> reflect on all these ideas, where they fit together, which one's me? Okay, it looks like we have everyone, so I'll go ahead and I'll post those results. Okay, excellent. There we go. Yeah, so a high, high percentage of individuals looking at that see that the team successfully comes from the communication, relationships, and the people resource aspect of that. And then the smatter across the other areas, creativity coming in there probably second in, in that polling as well, which uh, is often very common to see in a group uh, and, uh, and does play out. Now, it's interesting, and thank you, Sarah, for, for pulling that up. Uh, it's interesting that I look at that. Someone noted in real quickly, you don't have all of the above. And I guess that's a little bit of a, of a trick question then maybe because we, you really think about all the above would probably be appropriate. It is important that we have a sense of efficiency and execution and communication and creativity coming from a team dynamic. But I think the point to look at is how do we naturally begin to focus on that idea of team success? And I kind of put these into the, the, the quadrant perspective uh, of the whole brain thinking model so that efficiency and productivity, much more of those who like that blue quadrant have a preference there. Uh, the execution, much more from that green preference per standpoint, communication from that red preference standpoint, and creativity, innovation from more that yellow thinking preference. And that would kind of make sense based on the group of individuals that are joining us today. 
those of us in this world of HR and training and OD and working with teams to build that dynamic nature of teams tend to find ourselves often more on that red and yellow quadrant side of, of the model, looking at how we build those connections with people and how we begin to drive through for innovative ideas. But teams approach this very differently, and so sometimes this particular poll is very valuable in working with the team to get a sense of where does the team think its focus and priority starts from. Uh, for example, I'm working with a team right now that, that is a new product development team for uh, a technical organization. They create test equipment for government agencies so they can test the quality of, of certain materials that they have to use in, in their work. And so they tend to be very heavily focused in that blue and green quadrant from a thinking practice. And so when you talk to them about their team environment and their team purpose, they talk mainly about the efficiency, productivity, and execution of the team. And they tend to overlook that idea of communication and relationships and innovation and, and team synergy. And so it's kind of interesting when you work with them that they do shift their thinking. It has a real impact on how they begin to interact with one another and how they begin to approach problems and challenges and situations. So one of the tools that, that I suggest you consider using with teams is an action checklist, a team action checklist because it helps individuals recognize from the beginning of a team process what really do we need to be doing? What, how do we prioritize some of the things that you begin to see in the various quadrants on the screen? And that gives you a sense of where they would naturally want to start in that team dynamic. This can also be a very powerful tool in a team meeting. So maybe you're not looking at the whole activity of the team, but what's the purpose of our meeting today? What's the purpose of this meeting that's coming up? What should we be focused on? And if you have that sense that you understand where people are starting the conversation, then the challenge becomes, how do we begin to broaden that to a larger whole brain perspective, a bigger thinking diversity perspective, so we're making sure we don't miss things in the conversation. So I mentioned this technical team I've been working with, and as I mentioned, they tend to focus very heavily on that blue and green quadrant perspective. So when they completed something like this, they were looking at all of those efficiencies, research, measurements, you know, resources, policies, procedures aspect, and tended not to select things on that right-hand side. So naturally, their team meetings were very dynamic and intense around the modeling and the theory and the, the, uh, the structure of the of their discussion, very heavily listed, listing out things around procedures and policies for implementation. But they tended to overlook things around their customer, things around other employees in the organization, things about the longer-term vision. And so in working with them to understand that sense of purpose, I challenge them to think about their team meetings in a very different way to start on that right-hand side, to think about some of the things in the yellow and red boxes first, and then transition over into those blue and green things. And it really had a dynamic impact on how the team functioned. They actually tried to run several meetings starting in those yellow and blue quadrant areas, uh, yellow and red quadrant areas, I'm sorry. And they said it really changed the dynamic of the interaction. It changed how they thought about things. It changed how they communicated about things. It changed how they interacted around things. And they found they were bringing in other team members to give input on topics that in the past they would have overlooked them on. So they were looking at the people who had that stronger red or yellow quadrant preference to bring that perspective into the team dynamic. So when you think about building commitment to one another and building that sense of direction and purpose and drive, it's really important that you think about that. Are we bringing in all the people in the right timing and the right direction and covering those key elements to allow the team to be so successful? So, not so much where you start in the model that's listed here, a matter of are we allowing ourselves to think about dynamic and dynamics and items and issues from all of the quadrants so we have a bigger picture and a bigger perspective of what we're doing to the team rather than only focusing in the area that we feel most comfortable addressing. And again, this can work well for the overall team purpose and team direction, and it can work extremely well in a meeting-by-meeting -meeting sense of purpose and direction to help make sure you stay focused and on track. And another customer that's really been effective in doing this is Microsoft. And many of you may be familiar with the Xbox 360. And that's a game that you know, kids typically like to play, but it's really a game that the entire family can, can enjoy. And Microsoft recognized they needed to build gaming that truly really did talk to the whole family. And so they began to use a whole brain approach in how they built their team and how they focused the team, make sure that they had high performance on the team, they could develop the, the programs more quickly, and they could begin to reach a broader audience. So they were able to use the dynamic of this whole brain thinking process to do that more effectively. So they were able to think more clearly and, and, and more effectively across all the dynamics of what mattered to their team. And what they found is by doing that, they were able to decrease their, their, their production time by about 40%. They were able to speak to that broader audience. But more importantly, they found they brought out concepts, ideas, and input from team members who often were quieter in that 
you know, at Microsoft, you, as you might naturally assume, you see people who are very good on the technical side and very clear on that bigger innovation or big picture side of things. They struggle with how you got those things done and how it impacted the client. By bringing those voices to the table, they were able to round out their team much more fully, begin to get that stronger sense of purpose and commitment and accountability to allow the team as a whole to succeed and to be much stronger. So I think the key here is we do think about this from the standpoint of how do we build that diverse team by design, build that sense of agility, engage them effectively, and make sure we're still focused on the right purpose of where we need to go. Let's just talk for a few minutes about how that looks for us. How do we begin to build that sense of team success? How do we build diversity, agility, engagement, and focus into what we're doing? And I go back to uh, Katzenbach, who, who wrote a lot about high-performing teams. and said there are some key characteristics of high-performing teams, right? That they outperform what's expected of them. They're deeply committed to one another. They share that sense of leadership. And more importantly, they're flexible with one another. They can adapt to one another. And a lot of that comes from that sense of being able to understand where people are coming from and where people are going to and how you begin to, to work together most effectively. And what we find in working with teams is that when you have these four characteristics in place and the four elements we've discussed, it allows the team as a whole to achieve beyond what's ever expected of them. So I go back to where I started with that idea of the AD6 Nets and I said they achieved more than anyone ever thought they would because they built that sense of clear focus and direction with one another and interplayed in a way that no one expected them to. And that's when we have to challenge our teams and our organizations today. Our teams are kind of in that core to varied environment. We need to challenge ourselves with how are we going to move them to an outstanding, dynamic type of relationship by helping them understand how we bring in those varying uh, aspects and perspectives to, to the team dynamic. And again, back to that idea of the whole brain concept, we've done about a six-year study of team productivity, and we do find those that are able to think very diversely are able to be much more effective. The challenge in that is you may be thinking, well, Kevin, that's great when I get to set up my team from the beginning. If I get to go out and select the people on my team, I can go out and make the choice of who I want to put on that team. And I'll select the right types of individuals to bring into that team environment to make it successful. What do I do when I have a team that's given to me? You know, I show up to work, and now here's the new team I'm going to be working with. And I don't have the chance to really influence who's on that team. They're kind of handed to me. Then I would suggest that you look at it as a uh, kind of having that diversity by approach rather than diversity by design. But you begin to think about and recognize, as I said earlier, everyone has access to all the varying thinking preferences in, in, in their brain today. The challenge is how do we stretch ourselves, how do we adapt ourselves and reach into some of those quadrants where we may have less preference, but we can build some skill and some ability as we go forward. And so we sometimes have to do it by being diverse by approach and that we're forcing ourselves to stretch a little bit with one another so together we can, again, achieve those results we want. So the last thing we want to do is have everyone kind of functioning exactly the same way and, again, not getting the best result from the team as a whole. So a few uh, comments and kind of ideas that may kind of help pull all that together. What does this really mean to us? How do, we, how do we take this forward? I guess I would suggest one of the key things to recognize is that you know, legality by itself is not enough to get results. I know many of us, when we did that quick poll, so we really want to build that sense of communication and team interaction and positive team dynamic. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have teams of individuals who get along and work well together. But the ultimate goal of putting a team in place from a business perspective is we want to get a result. And so we have to make sure we keep the focus on the team in driving that result. We allow, allow the dynamics and the interaction of the team to grow from that. Uh, I was reading an article recently, uh, in, it was Talent Management Magazine, and the author said something to the effect that you know, people come to work wanting to be productive, and then the environments which cause set them up for success or confusion. And I think that's what happens here. Sometimes we send confusing messages to our team members, and we try to say, we really want you to drive a result, but you need to get along to do that. Uh, yeah, they do need to be able to engage effectively with one another, but that's not always just that we all like each other, we always agree with one another, and we always like one another in that process. Sometimes we need that sense of the positive conflict, the robust dialogue, some of that friction that allows the team to truly succeed above and beyond what could be expected of everyone just agreeing to things. And that's where the second point, it's not just about quick agreement consensus, it's truly about driving the ultimate result for the team. And so I'd suggest to think about that, that when we're trying to get a team to come to a result, come to resolution, we need to focus on what's the best answer, what's the, what's the wisest thing for that team to be doing, not just what's the, the thing that everyone agrees to. 
if they come to agreement too quickly, then I think we have to question and challenge ourselves on, are we bringing out that diversity of thinking? Are we bringing out that diversity of perspective? Are we bringing out other ideas that may get lost in the mix? We just move to collegiality and agreement too quickly. So from a team dynamic standpoint, we need to make sure we, uh, we have that good interaction, but we do it in a way that truly moves the team forward to that ultimate result. And then from an organization standpoint, we need to make sure that we think about uh, thinking diversity from a strategic stand standpoint. You know, I think it was Henry Ford that used to talk about, I really only want people's hands when they come to work, but when they come in, I get the whole person. I get their head, too. And I think we've realized over the last several years in organizations that when we get people's hearts and minds and their hands, we get the most out of individuals. And that needs to be a strategic initiative and direction for the organization as a whole, not just something we do one by one with teams, but something that we do across the organization. Because that allows us then finally to look at maximizing the full brain power of all of our employees. And that's really the key aspect to team dynamics and team interaction. Once successful teams, we've got to tie in all the members of that team so that they begin to see value and champion what the team is doing with those around them uh, in the organization outside of the team. Because that will have a big impact on how ideas coming out of the team are adopted, accepted, and implemented throughout the organization as a whole. So it's not just enough to have the team get along and be comfortable with one another. They have to, be able to achieve good results that are defensible and presentable and, and valuable to those outside of that team environment. And that's where we really begin to see the power and the dynamic uh, of successful teams. So I just leave you with the thought that if we're going to really build successful teams, we're going to maximize that power of the team to really get the best results, we need to think about driving diversity of thinking and agility of action. That's where things really begin to take place and happen in the team. And then we need to engage all of our team members so that we can focus on the outcome, not just the politics of working on teams and organizations. So that there is that sense of purpose and commitment and accountability. So the key is that maximizing team performance is really about starting with the diversity of thinking and building from that point forward out to the purpose so that we engage all of our team members effectively along the way. So with that, Sarah, I imagine there's probably some questions. I see some coming in already. Uh, they're probably coming up in your mind as well. I want to make sure we allow a little bit of time for that as well. And so uh, at that point, I'd like to take a few questions from, from the group, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we build successful teams uh, and maximize their results. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kevin. We do have some great questions coming in, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Feel free, as we're chatting here, to uh, continue to send in those questions, and we'll get to as many as we can today. So our first question here um, is from Cynthia. And Cynthia asks, how do we move from being a group to even being a team? Yeah, thank you for that, Cynthia. I think that's one of the challenges that we all face, because people make the assumption in an organization that because there's a group of people sitting in the conference room talking about the same topic, they must be a team. And that's not always the case. And I think we have to acknowledge that from the beginning. How did this group or how did this team of people come together? Was it people arbitrarily selected and put into that room, in which case we're now a group and we have to say, how do we begin to get that sense of understanding of one another, begin to adapt to one another, begin to set that direction of purpose in place? Or uh, is it very clear as to why people are coming into that room? Sometimes it's very clear. We need someone from each of these key departments to represent this aspect of, of, the, of the discussion. Either way, it comes back to understanding one another first. If we're going to move from a group to a team, we have to understand where are people coming from in this conversation. And it's not always just from their position. It's often from their thinking preference. Because I know some very strong accountants who, uh, by, nat by nature, you would think we be very strong in that blue and green quadrant, but they're able to really think about big picture things, but from a very different perspective than anyone else in the team. And if we overlook that and miss that, we allow it to function just as a group who's just kind of filling in the role they think they're supposed to be in, rather than a team of people who are really focusing and functioning in the group and the team the way they need to be functioning and interacting. So to me, the first step of moving from a group to a team is understanding and having confidence in your own thinking preference and then understanding other people's thinking preference so you can make sure you're adapting to one another and bringing out the best in one another in the discussion. Great. Uh, we have kind of a follow-up question here that sort of comes along with what you're already talking about, Kevin. And this is from Charles. Um, and, and he's really asking about that whole brain concept, whether it's an individual piece or a team piece. So Charles' question is, um, is it okay for a person or two 
to only be, say, a, a big picture thinker um, or any of those kind of four quadrants if the team accepts it? Or should the team really try and force more of a holistic, whole brain thinking out of each individual member of the team? Yeah, well, thanks for that, Charles. I, I would suggest all of us have access to each of the four quadrants of thinking. And so to keep ourselves only in one quadrant and use that as an excuse, well, I'm just a big picture thinker. Therefore, I don't have to think about the detail. It can be very dangerous. And now the team feels as though you're kind of, remember that boat at the beginning of the presentation? You're kind of keeping yourself up on the upper side of the boat, letting them down in the, the rough part of, of, the, of the heavy work. Uh, so at times, you need to be able to stretch across and say, OK, I can come out of my, my big picture thinking for a moment. Let me come down and work with you on some of that detail and support you there. It may not be my preference, it may not be my best skill set, but I'm willing to understand and appreciate that. So there is a time where you need to be able to stretch out of that preference. But I would suggest that many individuals are very, tend to have dominance in one or two of the thinking preference areas. So they will naturally tend to stay in that area unless the team encourages and invites them to step out of that. So to your point, yes, it's fine to start from that perspective. Here's the best perspective I believe I can bring to the team. But then we also have to recognize that sometimes we have to be quiet and allow the other people to add their perspective as well, and then allow that synergy to build as you begin to meld those pieces together. So as long as you're not dominating things and overriding other, other preferences and other people in the group, you can bring that strong preference to the table. And you will find that you mentioned about being, if, what if I happen to be strong in that uh, big picture thinking? That's kind of one of the challenging thinking preferences because you know, I tend to fall there a little bit myself, and so I can see that bigger picture, and sometimes I don't always appreciate or I don't feel other people appreciate the bigger picture we're trying to do. They get so focused on just the detail or the tactics or the, or the implementation issues. And so sometimes you have to have the confidence to invite them and say, please come with me for a little bit to, to my yellow preference. Come out and let's think big picture for a moment, and then we'll come back to the practical application. Because as a team, you have to keep that sense of where you're going. It can't just be about tactics and activity. You have to draw it something bigger. And so you can have that strength as a big picture thinker to draw that out sometimes. So I would encourage you to stay there, but I would encourage you to have confidence in what you can add to the team because of that preference. And just make sure you're understanding and appreciating the other people's perspectives as, as well. On that same line of thinking um, around that, that you know, respecting each, each person's strengths and weaknesses, Irene is asking around, um, really around, uh, becoming a really pr productive member of that team and feeling like a real real participant. So Irene mentions here that sometimes in one of her teams, she feels like her ideas are, are being shut down. They're not giving that fair chance. And how can you encourage or work through some of that conflict you mentioned earlier um, so that, so that you, know, you really can feel as if you're becoming a real participant of that team? Yeah, thank you for that, Irene. That's a tough place to be in sometimes, particularly uh, and I'm just going to pick one of the examples. So let's say you really understand how to get things done. You can put the details in place and make sure that everything's actually going to happen. And everyone else is talking about all the, you know, the financial modeling and the big picture and all these things. You don't feel like they're being very practical. That can really be a struggle. And that can happen with any quadrant. I'm just using that as the example for now. Uh, the opportunity you have there is, first of all, to think about how can I communicate my idea from their perspective. So how can I take this idea of a very practical application, as the example I'm using, and first say, from a big picture standpoint, we need to be going here. Therefore, I believe we need the following key steps in place to do that. So you reach across. You reach out to that to the preference of other people on the team, get them to understand that you appreciate where they're at, and now you want to add some value to the conversation. You want to add a different thought or perspective to it. Sometimes how we approach that communication opens up the dialogue let them see that you're not just throwing out ideas to throw them out. You're putting it in perspective, but you're appreciating them. And then sometimes you might recognize that even by doing that still as a struggle, uh, it may mean that then you have to really uh, work with the team as a whole to be confident to say, I don't feel my ideas are being valued here. Here's what I really feel I can add to the team, and I don't feel that perspective is really being honored. Uh, where, where can we make sure we spend some time on these key aspects that are really important to me to make sure we have team success. And then that may mean thinking about changing the dynamic of one of the team meetings, where you talk about it strictly from more of your perspective, and you get a chance to share more of your ideas and why you feel those can be valuable to the team. So it starts first with how you communicate with the team members on an ongoing basis, but it may mean very, stepping up very confidently and saying, I really feel we're missing a key perspective, and I feel that's going to hurt our ultimate outcome. 
So I'm asking for an opportunity to at least lay out that perspective for you and then get some of your input and feedback to that. And that sometimes will open up the, the opportunity to be valued, to be heard, and, and to kind of get that point across very effectively. So the best wishes to do that, Irene. That is always a challenging situation to be in. And I'm going to encourage you to be confident in what you can add, know kind of where you fit best in the team, and be confident in what you can add to that team dynamic overall. Great. That's great advice. Good. We have a couple questions coming in on how the whole brain model, how that then fits into some of the other popular um, learning models that are out there. And the, the first one is, um, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with it, um, as most of our audience probably is as well, is Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team. Can you kind of relate how, um, how this whole brain thinking gets into um, his concepts of teaming? Yeah, and that, thank you for that one. That's a very popular uh, team model that's often used in organizations where they say, I think Sunshine talks about the idea of building trust first and then from trust building uh, some, some positive interaction and then building a sense of productivity and, and moving ultimately to the end results of the, of the, of the team. And from my perspective, in working with organizations that are utilizing some of Lencioni's principles, uh, they have found this whole brain concept to be very powerful in establishing the first two phases of that. First, establishing the trust, and then establishing that open dialogue. Because by understanding your own preferences and having confidence in that, and then understanding other people's preferences and having confidence in their preferences, all of a sudden it opens up a very different perspective on conversation. So I mentioned this technical team I was working with just recently, and that was one of their biggest challenges. They were struggling to get beyond uh, that trust concept. They didn't quite call it that, but that's really the essence as they kind of assessed their team where they were struggling. And by doing the whole brain uh, assessment, looking at their whole brain perspective, they began to recognize that it wasn't that someone else was wrong necessarily, but they had a very different perspective on the issue. They brought a very different thinking preference to the table. And when they began to honor that with one another, they began to say, well, let me, let, let, why don't you come over to my blue quadrant for a little bit and let me explain the logic behind that. And then now let me come over to your red quadrant and understand how you feel it impacts the customer. All of a sudden that built a trust and confidence in one another that was not there before. So I think the whole brain model works extremely well with such models such as Lencioni's because it sets the foundation. Because I talked today about putting diversity of thinking and thinking agility, those are some of those key foundational pieces it takes to begin to move to that true productivity and execution. Without those pieces, now you're just kind of going through the motions, going through the discussions, going through the team meetings, and always feeling like, I don't really fit here. I don't really think my idea is valued. I don't really think I'm giving good input to the team, and maybe I just don't matter here versus really coming and saying, no, I have a powerful concept to, to share. I have a good perspective to share. And I can now share that with confidence. So I tend to find the whole brain model really sets a, sets a nice foundation for opening up that trust, that discussion, that dialogue that moves the team to higher levels of, of performance. So thank you for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin. You have uh, been a joy to work with. Your expertise have been wonderful. Those that are still on the line, if you have questions, continue to send those in. We're out of time here today. Um, so I know we have a couple questions that we have not been able to get to. And we will send all of the questions that have come in, as well as uh, Kevin's written responses. You'll get an email. Look for that email uh, sometime next week. You'll receive those. And I do want to give people a chance here to Stay in touch with both Kevin and HRDQ. Kevin can be reached at a variety of locations uh, on social media, by email, on their website. Um, there are additional resources for today's webinar, and there's the link at the bottom there at hermansolutions.com. So make sure to check those out. Um, you can get handouts and more detail as well on uh, the concepts that Kevin has presented today. And then stay in touch with HRDQU. We've got additional webinars coming up. Um, so register for our very next session. You'll receive an email with um, some coupons to be able to shop at hrdqstore.com um, and take advantage of um, some learning pieces there as well. Thank you again so much, Kevin. It, uh, it really has been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I really enjoyed the discussion and, and look forward to interacting with you again in the near future.